I'm glad that you're here today to worship. And, uh, and I pray there will be a blessing to you to be here today. My wife sends her greetings and regrets. You know, it, it seemed like in the Old Testament times, marriage uh, ceremonies used to last weeks. It seemed like our celebration of our 50th anniversary is lasting weeks. Uh, we, we, we just kind of follow the children's uh, directions. You get to a certain point in your life that whether you like it or not, you've got to listen to your children. And you can't say to them, you didn't listen to me when you were young. You can't, that doesn't work, okay? Because you'll need them more as you get older than they need you. You hear what I said? Be nice to your kids. So all we knew we had to save tomorrow, and then we started getting these messages, well, um, you gotta have another room for an adult to sleep in your house, okay? We knew some who were coming, but we didn't know the others, and so it's been surprises coming this week, and last night we had in our house what I would call um, joyful chaos. You ever had that in your house? Joyful chaos. And uh, things I thought were kind of winding down, uh, kids were up, our, the, the, the little ones who should have been in bed a long time before were still up, and, and it was just one of these wonderful Friday night events. I, I saw our oldest granddaughter, she was sitting in a chair and holding one of her cousins, one of our youngest grandsons, uh, Matteo, who's four years old. Matteo usually has a hard time understanding why steps are needed. You know, why can't you just jump from top to bottom? I mean, that's a perfectly logical way to travel. But there he was, late in the evening, just fully relaxed in the lap of our oldest granddaughter. And I said to myself, that's family. That's family. And the doorbell rang, and it was another group of relatives coming from Canada. So. So Ruth has gone to one of the local churches with some of the other family members, so you will forgive her. She sends her regards. Gracious Lord, we have come once again. You have answered our prayers to bring us to this house of worship. And I pray, Lord, that whatever has happened to us in the last few days, that today wonderful things will happen to us because you, our Lord and our Savior, you live and we hold on to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Peter was in trouble. Have you ever been in trouble? I see a few not. No. Some of you not? Boy, I, tell you, I wish there was a Catholic priest to make you confess that you really were couldn't do that. Can't, we Adventist pastors don't have that kind of authority. We can pray for things, you know, and that, that's the way it ought to be. It's between you and God. But we all have been in trouble at times. But some trouble is small trouble. Some trouble is real trouble. And Peter was in trouble, big trouble. He was in prison, and there was no one who was going to get him out of Herod's clutches. But somehow, as you know the story, a miracle occurred and angels of God opened the prison and he came out. You see, he didn't have much hope. Didn't have any hope. In fact, one writer says, Peter believed that the time had come for him to yield up his life for Christ's sake. This is the same Peter who not too long before denied Christ. You remember that? But now he was fully convinced, so writes Ellen White in 1911. April 27, 1911, she writes these words. Peter believed that the time had come for him to yield up his life for Christ's sake. It was all over. I wonder, as we sometimes in our minds wonder. I wonder if he even said to myself, maybe I'm being punished for denying the Lord. Maybe. 
Yeah, we do that sometimes in our mind. God doesn't work that way, by the way. God doesn't work. God, God doesn't look at our ledger of activity and say, now I'm going to teach you a lesson because you denied me three weeks ago. You're going to get it now. God doesn't work that way. God has a very inefficient accounting system. Now, some people may take offense in that and say, well, everything we do, everything we do, God knows of it, all the sins, and you're right. But listen to me. Though God knows, what can he do about it? What can we do about it? We can't undo the past. So God has chosen a route that we would not have chosen. He chose the route of forgiveness. God forgives once and twice and three times and keeps forgiving us. Some of you are saying, well, Pastor, you're encouraging sinning. No, I'm not. I'm accepting the reality of sinning. There's a big difference there. God forgives. But there's Peter, sense of hopelessness, sense of, I'm done. Nothing's going to happen to me except death is coming my way. And yet, when we are at our lowest point, when we are ready to give up, when we have no hope in us, when we don't think anyone can help us, God oftentimes comes in those moments and does the unexpected. Isn't that true? Unexpected. And that's what God chose to do here. He did the unexpected. Instead of allowing Peter to be put to death, God rescues him from the prison. That happens sometimes. In, has that ever happened to you in your life? I think it does. I, I know my, my parents tell me in 1946, 1946, we'd been in a concentration camp for about a year. And uh, three different camps to be exact. We're in the third camp. And the word got out among the inmates, us, the families, that tomorrow was not going to be a good day. Well, there's never a good day in a concentration camp, but some days are worse than others. The word got out that the communist soldiers that had imprisoned us were going to take us into the woods and execute everybody. That was the word. Tomorrow morning, the march would start. And we were told to get ready to go on a march. They tried to make some escape plans and so on, but the reality is they knew it wouldn't work for everybody, for sure. Maybe a few of us would survive. But the next day, instead of being marched out to our death, the surprise of surprises came. They released us from the camp. It wasn't supposed to be that way. In the least expected moments, God sometimes intervenes. We live in a world. We live in a world where there's a lot of evil. There's a lot of good, but there's a lot of evil. And evil interferes, and oftentimes it is so powerful. And every so often, God intervenes. I don't know why he doesn't do it always. If you're suffering some illness, sometimes God intervenes, and sometimes he doesn't. And I don't know why it goes that way, and neither do you, and neither does anyone else. But every so often, God intervenes. When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God why he intervened at certain times and other times he didn't. And I think you're going to ask the same thing. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I used to. When I was a young pastor, it was much easier to understand. God knows God will take care of you. And sometimes it doesn't go the way you hope it will go. But here's one instance. Here's one instance where God shocked Peter with a Wonderful surprise. A dramatic story. Peter is released. He goes down the street. He says, i got to get out of here. I mean, you know, these, these guys are going to catch me again. And he goes to the door of some of his fellow believers, and he knocks there. So, what can we learn from this 
dramatic story. I use the word dramatic because the scripture is a dramatic book. If you think the Bible is boring, it most likely is so because you haven't been reading it. True. You read the Bible and you realize the drama that takes place there, the unexpected, the mysteries that are revealed, the endings that you never anticipated. They're all in there. What can we learn? I think there are at least three things. Number one, listen to the knock. Listen to the knock. Peter, I can just imagine. I can just imagine he's knocking on the door. He don't want to do it too loudly because the wrong people may hear it. And Peter doesn't belong there. Peter is a Galilean. He has an accent. It's like me knocking on somebody's door and speaking in New Orleans. They know I'm not from there. My New York accent and everything else I've picked up in life in the countries I lived in, it's not a good accent to have in New Orleans, is it? Not a good one. Peter is knocking, afraid that somebody might hear him. He doesn't want to ask people for directions. Peter knows that the enemies of God people are out there. They're still persecuting. They could still arrest him. I want to tell you something. You and I as church members, as individuals, listen carefully to the knock on the door. We need to listen carefully. When people come to our church, listen carefully what they're telling you. Don't judge them. Listen to what they're telling you. People come to the church because God has moved them to come to the church. If you have family members, loved ones, who maybe don't know the Lord, listen to them carefully. And don't drown them with your answers. Open the door gently and listen to them. That's what is happening there. We need to be sensitive to the gentle knocks that we hear of our children, of our adults, of our seniors, whoever it is. So first of all, this story tells us, listen to the knock. Secondly, open the door. It seems logical, but so oftentimes we don't. We don't. Open the door, but be sure you open the door to the right person. Open the door to the right person. Don't, as the fairy tale says, don't open the door to the big bad wolf. You know what happens when you open the door to the big bad wolf? You're gone. Here's someone's lunch. Open the door to the right person. If you're having problems with abusing your body, your mind, with drugs, don't open the door to somebody who will give you more. If you're having problems with alcohol, don't open the door to someone who will give you another beer or whiskey or whatever. Don't do it. You do that, you're in trouble. If you're having challenges of being faithful in your marriage, don't open the door to someone who will create a greater problem. Be careful who you open the door to. Open the door to the one who loves you, who cares for you. Come with me to Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Revelation chapter 3. It's a chapter that Adventists love to read about the seven churches. It's a chapter that has all kinds of stories of churches. And then you go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, and begins the story to the angel of the church in Laodicea. We call ourselves Laodicea, right? We say that historically we are the seventh church. Hmm. Most of the sermons I hear from Revelation chapter 3 are telling us how bad we are. Am I right? 
Oh, the church is terrible. The church is falling apart. God is not happy with us. Have you heard such messages? You go on the internet. Those are the messages you get. The Adventist church, not worth it anymore. It's all over. And yet, in this chapter, chapter 3, in the midst of some of the condemnations that God gives, that Jesus pronounces against the church, there's chapter 3, verse 20. What does it say? Who's speaking here? Jesus Christ. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Not a beautiful not a beautiful passage in the midst of the judgment of God? See, God pronounces judgment to remind us that we can't solve the problem on our own, but that he can. Isn't that wonderful? God pronounces judgment. He says all kinds of things about God's people in Laodicea. But then, let's not forget 3.20. Jesus is gently knocking, and he wants to come in and to eat with us. Have you ever had to eat a meal with someone who you can't, whom you can't stand? Or you don't have such people in your life? Okay. Well, I've heard it said. I've heard it said that if you sit down and eat a meal with your Enemy. You know what the word means, at least. You may not have any, but you know what it means. That's a terrible experience, isn't it? You, enjoy, you, you can enjoy bad food if it's good company. Isn't that true? Yeah. A boring meal becomes an exciting event if you're sitting with a good friend and eating the meal. Yeah? No? Okay. Somebody's agreeing with me. Yes. Here... Jesus gives us this beautiful example of the one who pronounces judgment, and yet he says, I want to come and sit down and have a meal with you. Why? Because I love you. I'm with you. Open the door to the right person and both will rejoice. It's, it's, amazing. it's amazing how simple acts in life can bring a lot of joy to us. Have you noticed that? Simple acts. When I was a younger pastor, they would ask me to go sometimes to the youth camp in northern New York and to be the pastor for the week with the kids. You know you're getting old when they no longer ask you to do that. Okay? I don't exactly remember what years that was, but... I remember being asked to go up there in upstate New York in the beautiful Adirondack Mountains there. And there'd be all these kids, you know, from all over upstate New York. And, and I remember they asked me to go one week when these were kids, not from our churches, but we sponsored children from some of the larger cities there. Kids who were in difficult situations. Kids who had a hard life. And maybe they thought, because I lived in cities most of my life, that maybe I could be of help to them. And I would have a devotional in the morning, and I would tell stories in the evening to them, and be around there, and just, just, just spend time with those kids. And in one lunch, after lunch, I was sitting somewhere, and three or four of the kids came to me, and they said, and they named one of the kids, he's got a real problem, Pastor. He's crying, and, and well, what's going on? Well, he's really, really upset because his parents are getting divorced. Wow, that's painful. I hear in our culture oftentimes, well, yeah, my husband and I are getting divorced, but it's an amicable divorce, and our children know we still love them. Let me tell you something. You can pretend that, but the children are going to be hurt. Let me tell you that. There's pain. That answer is a Hollywood answer. You know, Hollywood tells, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, we, we still love each other. But 
they said, Pastor, he's really crying. He just really, could you go and talk to him? So I, I went over there and sat next to him. And sure enough, you know, I think my coming made him sob even more. You know, you kind of feel guilty almost, you know. I finally slowed down a little bit. And I'm trying to probe gently what is going on. And, and, and you know, well, what's, what's happening? You know, what, what's with your family? And well, family, you yeah, know, well, Somehow I realized the family wasn't the issue. And I, well, what, what, what made you so upset? And then, through tearful tones, he said, I didn't get the ice cream. I didn't get the ice cream. See, what happened... It came out in sobs and sobs cascading all over the campground. He said that what happened is that the rule was you had to finish your meal by a certain time and then you could get your dessert. Well, I don't know, sometimes kids linger. You have kids like that sometimes? Yeah, some of them linger. You know, they'd eat, they wouldn't finish breakfast until lunch if you allowed them not to. And he didn't finish that. He was reminded, and the other kids got the ice cream, and he did not get the ice cream. And every time he used the word ice cream expression, he sobbed all over again. Now, some of you are going to say he shouldn't have had it anyway. It's bad for his body. Forget it. Go tell it to the kid. Don't tell me. Life is real, you know. So, so what am I going to do? So I used my prerogative as an adult. I went to the lady in charge of the kitchen. I said, you know, I didn't take an ice cream. I like only certain ice creams, you know, chocolate, you know, smothered ice cream is okay. I know there are two bad things I eat now, but that, that's okay. Uh, I said, I didn't, you know, oh, she said, of course you can have one. You see, as I'm, it's amazing how we treat adults differently than children sometimes, isn't it? I could have one. The time was over, but I could have one. So I said, well, I, 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 okay, thank you very much. So I took the ice cream and I, I gave it to him. And joy came into that little life because he had ice cream. Problems were solved. Let me, listen to me, please. Open the door in the most gracious way to people who come to the church and into your life. Maybe that's all they need at that moment. It may seem so simple, just as simple as giving somebody a little ice cream bar, but that's what they need at that time. That's what this lesson tells us. Thirdly, welcome the one who is knocking. Welcome the one who is knocking. Rejoice! When people come to church, rejoice that people turn to you, like young Rhoda did, the servant girl there. Rejoice. But may I remind you, open the door. Don't be like Rhoda. What did she do? She heard the knock. It's Peter, she said. Obviously, she knew his voice. And what did she do? She ran back in the house and forgot to open the door. And what did they say to her? Rhoda, you are out of your mind. They didn't take it seriously. It's amazing. It's amazing how we are, a, we, we are capable of not listening to other people, especially people whom we label as not being important. You are out of your mind. There was another time when people said that to a group of individuals. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. I'd like you to turn there. Luke chapter 24. You better turn there because what I'm going to tell you, you may have a hard time believing. So I'd like you to read it in your own Bible. Luke chapter 24. Well, you know what the story begins like there. In Luke chapter 24, on the first day of the week, early in the morning, the women took the spices, and where were they going? To embalm Jesus, right? To prepare.
prepare him for burial. Because they couldn't do it Friday, so it's Sunday morning now. The Sabbath is gone. Now they're going to do it. But then, in the midst of that total disappointment, God interrupted. It's nice to have God interrupt. They came there to bury him. God says, no, you're not going to bury him. No, no. Jesus has risen. And they were confused. I'd be confused, would you? Not be confused. No, nobody believed Jesus promised they would be resurrected. So why wouldn't you be confused? The disciples didn't. Nobody did. And so it says there that the angel told him, remember, he was to be raised on the third day. Then they remembered his words. And what did they do then? It says, in verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. So who did they tell the story to? The disciples of Jesus. Judas by now was gone. He was dead. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the disciples. What, what did you notice about the names? Who were these people? They were what? Women. Women. But they, meaning the apostles, the eleven and the others, did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Nonsense. Who are these women that we're going to believe them? Who are these individuals? I want to tell you something as a church, as a denomination, I want to throw out a caution sign. We have spent quite a bit of time and energy discussing the role of women in the church. Hear me what I'm going to say. Let's not dismiss women as being a bunch of nonsense. Let's be careful. Let's be careful. A lot of the discussion that we've had has been totally out of line. When I read individuals whom some of you may even admire make statements like, well, women whole are, are intellectually inferior. I'm saying, excuse me? What train did you fall off? Hmm? How dare we do that? See, that's what the disciples did. Oh, these women, this is a bunch of nonsense. This is a bunch of nonsense. And some of you are now, right now, saying, we got an old man who is a pastor, but he's a radical. Well, the Word of God is radical. I'm going to tell you that. The Word of God is radical. we got a problem in this world. There are no easy solutions. Only God has the solutions. Let's be careful. Let's be careful how far we go. All I know, in the earth, we have Adventists, women who were evangelists, pastors, doing all kinds of ministries. And the rumor has it that we even had a prophet who was a woman. Isn't that amazing? I wonder what would happen today if Ellen White were called today to be a prophetess. We got all kinds of internet experts who would condemn her. That God can't do that. I wonder what would happen there. Let me tell you something. Ice cream may be bad for us, but the internet can devastate us. Just because somebody posts it and because somebody calls themselves to be an expert, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Or because somebody has the money to print something, don't believe it. Become a student of the Word of God. Look to the Word of God. Look what God has done over the years. Those of you who are visitors, I was once an editor too. So some of this is editorial. And my congregation is gracious. They allow me that. At least for a while. Till you find somebody more capable. Russ, where are you? 
a message for you. Okay? The emphasis is on find. Okay? But until then, look to the Word of God. Look at the history of the church. Look how the church has grown. We dare not put each other down. We can disagree, but not putting down. There is no room for putting each other down in our church. How dare we do that? You see, what happened there is the church was united in prayer. One writer says, Meanwhile, continuous prayer was being offered for Peter by the United Church in Jerusalem. By the United Church in Jerusalem. They focused. We need to pray for each other. Each day, I hope you take some time and travel in your mind through the congregation. Because we always sit pretty much in the same place, don't we? Remember where people are and pray for them. And pray for them. That's what this lesson is. We leave this dramatic story with two points. Do what Job did. Remember the passage? I opened the door to the strangers. Open the door. Two, invite the right person into your life. And that is none other than Jesus Christ. Invite the right person. He's standing. He's not crashing the door. He's not banging. He's not forcing himself in. He's there. Peter was probably silent because of fear. Jesus taps on the door because he wants us to make a decision. He respects us. But by all means, open the door to the Lord Jesus Christ. Allow him to come into your life. Will you do that? Will you do that? In the privacy of your prayers, as Jesus says in Matthew 6, 6, Close the door, another door story. Close the door and pray. That doesn't mean that we don't pray collectively. We do. We should. But when you and I close the door, that's when we can truly open our heart to the Lord Jesus Christ and pray. And so I say to you, invite Jesus Christ to come to the door that you will open. God bless you.